it's it's sad for me not to be amongst you um, due to extraneous circumstances, but I am certainly with you in spirit. And I have already heard this morning very inspirational and important interventions by the ambassadors and other uh, opening statements. I want to, of course, begin by thanking once again the organizers, the Air Center, uh, and the Civil Rights Defenders for hosting the Rule of Law Forum in the Western Balkans. I have been a part of this forum for a number of years. I always think this is an incredibly important venue for those that believe in democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. I also want to echo words already mentioned about the issue of gender equality and the recently and hopefully soon to be very important gender judiciary network in the Western Balkans. I'm very proud to be a part of that initiative and working uh, with uh, those that are willing and indeed think it important to see gender equality is an integral part of the protection of human rights in the Western Balkans and also all over the world. I come to you just a few weeks after the closure of my mandate as judge and president of the European Court of Human Rights. I am myself in a period of personal and professional transition. However, as I recently stated in my farewell ceremony, at my farewell ceremony in Strasbourg, Whilst my journey as a European human rights judge has come to an end, my journey as an active European citizen continues unabated. For I do not have a choice. None of us do if we believe in freedom and true democracy. One of the issues that we are dealing with is the following. We are at a point, at a tipping point, when it comes to democratic backsliding and challenges to the rule of law. To prevent the further rise of autocracy, or what some have attempted to camouflage as a liberal democracy, requires each and every one of us to continue to fight for those rights and values which have constituted the cornerstone of our way of life since the Second World War. We live in an era of upheaval, uncertainty, and great challenges. Liberal democracy is simply under threat. Now, this is not just a banal, uh, very vague assumption. It is a true threat. And for those of us at this fora who are an integral part of the process of maintaining the fundamentals of our societies, it is one we have to take seriously. The preeminent structure of liberal democracy was famously termed the end of history by Professor Francis Fukuyama exactly 30 years ago, by which he claimed it to constitute the final form of government for all nations. Now, as we speak, this claim is being frontally challenged all over the world. For example, just recently, it comes as no surprise, in my view, that the Russian civil society organization Memorial are one of the recipients, one of the three recipients of this year's Nobel Prize for Peace, along with their freedom fighters in the region. They symbolize the transformative nature of the struggle for democracy through civil society, by promoting the right to criticize power and protect the fundamental rights of citizens. This is the exact wording of the Nobel Committee that awarded this year's Nobel Prize for Peace. Now, in short, we must not give up our fight for making Fukuyama's claim become a reality. And I wanna be blunt here. In my view, there is simply no other acceptable form of government which can sufficiently protect the three main moral and legal principles of human life upon which happiness, stability, and prosperity rely. Dignity, equality, and liberty. The problem I think we must address and what I would want to talk about in this keynote speech is perhaps that we have lost sight of what liberal democracy really means in these times of crisis. What it requires and how we can make it effective to protect and preserve the fundamental principles of human dignity, equality, and liberty. In this regard, and I ask you all in this room, we have to ask ourselves, what is the role of the judiciary? It is important. How should judges react to the divide that has arisen in our societies, to conflict, to challenges for democracy and human rights that an area of crisis creates? I see the workshops and the seminars today will discuss that. I'm extremely 
honored and proud that my former colleagues and friends will be with you, judges of the European Court of Human Rights, to discuss issues of judicial scrutiny during times of crisis and also other important issues. These are eminent international judges with a background which I'm sure will contribute to the debate. So in my intervention here today, I will make and defend the claim that the founders of the European Convention on Human Rights realize that liberal democracy is the cornerstone of a collective community of human life. They understood that by their very nature, human beings living in communities with others must find ways to evade conflict and resort to decision-making processes that are respectful and sensitive to the common interests of all peoples. They understood that human beings have a tendency to affiliate with like-minded groups, both in body and spirit, thus risking the oppression of the others, which most often are the vulnerable, the minority, or the politically underrepresented. After all, these were the horrible teachings of the Second World War. The European Convention on Human Rights was therefore infused with an inclusive concept of democratic government. And as I will demonstrate, the European Court of Human Rights has enforced that inclusive form of government in its case law for the last 63 years. And I'm quite certain, although I will myself not be an integral part of that process, I'm certain that the court will continue to do so. I just want to proceed in two parts. Firstly, I will describe in more detail what I mean by inclusive democracy, drawing on the case law of the Strasbourg Court. On that basis, I will in my second part identify current crises and challenges and briefly attempt to look to the future before concluding. The former president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, Lady Brenda Hale, once famously proclaimed in a judicial opinion, democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. This magnificent phrase, in my view, and I've said this very often, captures beautifully the scope and parameters of the concept of inclusive democracy, which is firmly anchored in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Indeed, this inclusive view of the democratic concept has a long historical pedigree in our court. Almost 40 years ago, the plenary of the old court said the following in the famous judgment in Young, James and Webster versus the United Kingdom. And I quote, Although individual interests must on occasion be subordinated to those of a group, democracy does not simply mean that the views of a majority must always prevail. A balance must be achieved which ensures the fair and proper treatment of minorities and avoids any abuse of a dominant position. This is the core of the judicial role. The core of the judicial role of any European judge that takes his or her role seriously. Whilst it is clear that compromise is often necessary for the furtherance of peace in a democratic society, political action in achieving such common solutions, which excludes the meaningful participation of marginalized groups or minorities is, ana is anathema to, the, to a true and inclusive democracy. This is the great challenge today, unchecked, unchecked, majority rule that takes no account of the interests of the minority. And indeed, a majority which fir firmly is viewing the interests of a subset of the majority, not the majority as a whole. This risks descending into authoritarianism. This is our current reality. And I always say this when I get the opportunity to speak to politicians. Elections do not create omnipotence. This is, I submit, the core of inclusive democracy. We see politicians emphasizing more and more that they have a democratic mandate, which in fact means that they should only speak and act for their people, but not the others. Representative politics is thus reduced to a power game where the winner takes off. It is based on a belief that representative politics, where representation is exclusive, not inclusive, is morally justified. But I ask you this, is this belief in the virtues of representative politics belied by past and more recent history? I mean, the answer seems clear to me. 
a society of rational human beings, a community of civilized peoples can learn from their past failures, readily accept the weaknesses that we all have as human beings. Society may have readily experienced that the opacity, inconsistency, and often fudge of the political process can carry with it grave dangers. That is the fundamental premise of the European Convention on Human Rights adopted after the Second World War. European societies established a structure of liberal democracy in which certain fundamental rights and values were given normative status, limiting majoritarian rule. In this manner, they attempted to make the political process itself more rational, less prone to being dominated by gut feelings, by fear, anger, and hatred, all primitive human elements that have given life to populists and ultimately self-destructive tendencies. This is the world we live in today, ladies and gentlemen, and that is why our role, the role of judges, lawyers, practitioners, politicians that are open to understanding their role in an inclusive culture of democracy and human rights is become so important. At its core, the claim that democracy simply means majority rule, a purely exclusive concept that accentuates factionalism and vested interest, constitutes a claim that human life should be really fully regulated by pure politics and not by the law. This is, I think, what we see from many political leaders today. Law has become a nuisance, something that they feel should not inhibit their democratic mandates. And we increasingly see this development putting pressure on the relationship between government and the judges, with often loud calls by politicians to limit the powers of judges certainly in international courts like the, the Strasbourg Court. But I say this to you and all that are partaking in the rule of law forum in the Western Balkans, and I say again, the rule of law forum, that that is not acceptable. It is our role to maintain the balance between politics and law. And I ask you this, is this really the time in European history to place our bet on more politics and less law, to entrust our destiny to the existence of good faith in the political process and argue in favor of limiting the review powers of independent and impartial judges. And I mean, truth is after all the cornerstone which brings us to the great challenge of rampant disinformation in our dig digital societies. Political decision-making will become ex exceedingly difficult if we cannot agree on what the factual truths are upon which politic political decisions are made. Because the fundamental premise of democratic politics is that societal solutions and communal compromises are adopted on the basis of some minimum set of shared values and the existence of objective truths. Does that premise hold true in contemporary political processes in our part of the world? I fear not. Nationalism, tribalism, dislocation, fears of social change, and the distrust, distrust of outsiders are on the rise again. As people limited by their partisan silos and digitized filter bubbles are losing a sense of shared reality and the ability to communicate across social and sectarian lines. Now, I just want to be absolutely clear at this point, and I think for the judges in the room, this is important. I do not speak of weakening the role of politics, but rather for law to continue to sustain its true and inclusive democratic character. By this, I also do not mean that pure policy issues and matters of high politics should be resolved in the courtroom. Far from it. But I do argue that in the age we live in, independent and impartial judges are quite fundamental for the sustained legitimacy of the political process and the separation of powers, in particular in times of crisis like we experienced during the pandemic. I hope you will reflect on this 
separation of powers dilemma. The idea, what is the role of a judge in a situation faced with an almost existential crisis which pushes politics towards restricting individual freedoms? It is an exceedingly difficult conundrum, but it is one in which all of us need to reflect on continuously. And I think to sum up this first part, it is within this context that one should view the overall historical trajectory of the European Convention on Human Rights. The inclusive democratic concept under the convention is manifested in different ways. For example, already in the 1970s and 80s, before majoritarian views had progressively evolved to these issues in Europe, the court took a pioneering interpretive stance to issues of children born out of wedlock towards the protection of private and family life of LGBTI persons and the discrimination of Roma people, to name just some of the more salient areas. This is because the convention requires the interests of all human beings to be the subject of good faith democratic action and not subjected to disproportionate and unreasonable majoritarian stigma and oppression. This is the only way that the three major moral principles of democratic life are protected, human dignity, equality, and liberty. This is not a counter-majoritarian approach, as some politicians would like us to believe, but simply the enforcement of the true scope and purpose of an inclusive concept of democracy. When it comes to the principles of democratic governance, which are particularly important here today, when we discuss democratic backsliding and the role of judges in times of crisis, the court has moreover robustly defended freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and the right to free and fair elections, all fundamental elements of a true concept of inclusive democracy. For it is anathema to inclusive democracy to exclude the interests and views of the others. Inclusive democracy requires the interests of all to be a part of the overall democratic calculus. This is the way we should understand the court's consistent references for decades to the importance of pluralism, broad-mindedness, and tolerance as the hallmarks of a democratic society. These are not empty concepts, ladies and gentlemen, because a dictator and an autocrat are unable or unwilling to govern within a pluralistic, broad-minded, and tolerant mindset. Because these fundamental hallmarks of a democratic society, they threaten their monopoly of power. Exclusive democracy, or to use an even better term invoked by some in Europe, and you all know who I'm talking about, illiberal democracy, only in fact protects the interests of the majority and even only as I mentioned a moment ago, a subset of groups within that majority that wield the reins of power. It is therefore put under pressure by pluralism, a broad-minded view of democratic life and a tolerant attitude towards the others. The European Convention on Human Rights was exactly designed to prevent the rise of illiberal forms of majoritarian governments. And the Strasbourg Court has consistently played an important role in this regard for the last 63 years. Allow me now to turn to my second part, reflecting in a bit more detail on the current state of democratic crises, the challenges we face and the future. Recently, the court has more and more had to rely on Article 18 of the convention which prohibits the use of ulterior, abusive, and arbitrary motives in restricting convention rights. This is a fundamental rule of law provision. This provision has been particularly important in cases coming from transitional democracies where civil society have waged a massive struggle for freedom and the creation of an inclusive form of democratic governance. These cases depict in fact, the reality in which raw political power has been used to remove political opposition forces from influencing the trajectory of national politics. 
This trend is manifested in the retrogression of inclusive liberal democracy in some member states. The ultimate and catastrophic development of this trend towards the destruction of democracy is, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As I have previously publicly stated whilst I served as president of the Strasbourg Court, this tectonic and transformative event in modern European history is an example of what happens when true and inclusive democracy has failed to take hold. When the majority enforces a unilateral and oppressive view of the right way to live on the others, and when the full social and cultural history of a nation is reduced to the anachronistic view of the powerful. No pluralism of views, no broad-mindedness, no tolerance, the power of one for the interests of the few. Whilst the war in Ukraine is only the most egregious manifestation of democratic decay in Europe, let's not be naive and think that this is a limited occurrence. No, we, must, we see similar trends in our backyard all across Europe. So how should we respond? And I'll conclude by giving a potential response or my reflections in four parts. Firstly, the rise of exclusive illiberal democracy has been made possible because our post-Second World War project towards economic prosperity has taken a bad turn. If there is anything we inherently react to as human beings, it is injustice and unfairness in the distribution of economic prosperity and entrenched limitations on social mobility. Poverty and uncertainty as to whether we can put food on our tables, receive health care or educate our children, embolden the populists and the enemies of freedom, for they seek to recruit the afflicted to their cause. But their opportunistic gambit is more often than not a facade, for they seek only to profit from the rage of inequality to accumulate power for the benefit of the few. History has repeatedly taught us what the end game is in these circumstances. It is social strife, misery, conflict, and ultimately warfare. For us to avoid this historical repetition, inclusive democracy is the only viable answer, but it will require a social and economic realignment towards the vision of true and substantive equality. Secondly, and crucial for your debate during the forum, the separation of powers and the rule of law, the lodestar of the convention system must be defended at all costs. It is inherent in inclusive democracy that power must be checked, abuse must be held to account, and no more so than in times of crisis. The classical principles of legality, the rejection of unfettered executive powers, and the balancing of interests by way of applying the principle of proportionality are the core tools of the judicial process in such times, all of which I know you will discuss in detail during the forum. To be clear, the rule of law and inclusive democracy go hand in hand. One cannot survive without the other. This is the reason for the recent developments in the court's case law, robustly enforcing the independence of the judiciary, a trend we have also seen in the Court of Justice of the European Union. Of course, judges themselves must be aware of the limits of their power, but they must not shy away from enforcing the limits of the rule of law and inclusive democracy when necessary. My third point, reacting to a crisis in democracies requires a robust re response to digital disinformation, the relativization of, of any proper account of objective factual truths. Here judges and the legal community becomes very important. The utter chaos, the utter chaos of mixed digital messaging and information is one of the greatest challenges facing humankind, and here 
we have a powerful role to play. In May next year, the Council of Europe, the pan-European organization, which includes not only the 27 EU states, but also uh, other 19 European countries, including the countries of the Western Balkans, will hold its fourth ever summit of heads of state in my home country of Iceland. It is imperative that the Council of Europe seize this moment to robustly reestablish and reinforce its fight for the rule of law and democracy in full harmony with the European Union, together fostering a true European political community. This will require creative thinking at all levels. And I think also full attention should be given to novel research in the political sciences. For example, calling all, on all European leaders to adopt what has been termed connectedness as a criterion of governance. By this, policymakers should ask three related questions when making decisions. First, whether their actions reinforce or break down social boundaries between people. Second, whether their decisions can be adjusted to strengthen the sense of connection between people. And third, whether their actions will lead people to trust the institution of democracy more and participate in its efforts. This then brings me to my fourth and final remark the empowerment of the young and a collective mentality shift in society towards connectedness. Indeed, I would call it togetherness. Here I would like in particular to address the young people in the room. We all need to speak up and become active defenders for inclusive democracy in all facets of our lives. And judges must lead by example with their professionalism their principled and independent and impartial respect for the rule of law in all of their actions. We must understand that inclusive democracy does not come naturally to human beings. It is a choice, a decision. It must be fought for every day, always. It requires us to listen to one another, to not to condemn others for being different or for having views we may dislike. It requires us to forego being judgmental of how others choose to lead their lives, but rather to embrace diversity and pluralism of viewpoints. It requires us to understand that we all deserve dignity, equality, and to be free in body and spirit. The future is now, and we have all have to seize the moment to overcome the existential struggle that must be won. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude. Every generation in human history has been faced with challenges that affect the trajectory of human life. The challenges we face are clear. Do we uphold and protect the inclusive democracy and the rule of law as the final form of government for all nations, or do we accept its demise? The articulation of the challenge we face can be put in those stark terms, I'm afraid. The rule of law forum is one fora where this is the discussion point. I'm the eternal optimist, perhaps because failure is not an option. I simply don't believe or want to believe that human beings are condemned to always making the same mistakes. Human reason and an inherent sense of the importance of dignity, equality, and liberty for happiness and prosperity are powerful, very powerful tools. It has made us who we are. If we believe in them, they will also make our future. Thank you very much for having me, although from afar.